My addiction started when I was around, it was after my mom died, so around 13. Um, I started experimenting with like alcohol, pills, uh, weed, things like that. And eventually it just escalated into heroin, meth, and Xanax. I felt like taking these drugs were kind of my escape to feel normal, to feel happy, to feel loved. You know, I didn't actually feel that, but the drugs kind of made a fake false of hope for me. I was 19 years old and I went to my first rehab in Anaheim, California. I actually started going to cosmetology school. I enrolled, um, I was doing good, and I wasn't dealing with my addiction. I wasn't going to meetings like I was supposed to. I wasn't focusing on anything in my recovery. I was just pushing it back like bottled emotions, not healing anything, not talking about it, not talking about all the pain and everything that I was covering up with my addiction in the beginning. And it just bursted and I couldn't handle anything and I just said, whatever. I left cosmetology school, I left my sober living, I got kicked out and I just, I went back to using. The second time that I was, um, I guess in treatment, I guess you would say I was pregnant. And uh, you can't really go into a rehab when you're pregnant. So I was alone on the streets. I didn't know what to do and I knew that I had to get help. I didn't know how I was gonna do it, but I needed help. So I ended up calling my friend who is also in recovery and um, her mom and her plan to take me to a detox center, the same one, my Anaheim one. The detox center wouldn't take me, but by then my friend and her mom had already left. So the detox center took me to a hospital. My insurance wouldn't work for that hospital, so they couldn't take me. And I called my dad, who I hadn't talked to in maybe like a month or something. And I just told him, I said, Dad, I'm pregnant, and I'm homeless, and I'm in a hospital, and you need to come get me. He freaked out, and he's calling people to try and come and get me, because it would take him a while to get there. Nobody could come, so he flew out to Los Angeles and picked me up. So I waited three days in a hospital waiting room, pregnant, about maybe four or five weeks pregnant. He took me on a flight, and we went back to Lake Charles, Louisiana, where he's from and they brought me to a, like an outpatient recovery center where they put me on um, Suboxone, which is a drug that helps you from going into withdrawal because when you're pregnant and you're a heroin addict, if you go into withdrawal, you lose the baby, no matter what. It doesn't matter what um, trimester you are. So they have to keep you from going into withdrawal. So I was put on Suboxone throughout my pregnancy and they weaned me to a really low dose so that Phoenix wouldn't have to go through anything. I was 18 weeks gestation. I found out Phoenix had a hole in his heart, which is just one small thing to all of his defects, but they found the hole in his heart and then I went back at 30 weeks and they diagnosed him with um, a whole different heart defect called truncus arteriosus, which was wrong, but that's what they were predicting. And then the full diagnosis came after he was born, which was uh, tetralgia fallot with pulmonary atresia, uh, a VSD, which is a ventricle septal defect, a hole in the heart, and MAPCAS, which is major aortal pulmonary collateral arteries. So that's seven congenital heart defects. So Phoenix's heart defects were actually caused by a genetic defect that he has. It's called DeGeorge syndrome where it's similar to Down syndrome, where he's missing his chromosomes instead of adding chromosomes. Um, this did not have anything to do with my addiction. Um, when I found out I was pregnant with Phoenix, I was on just heroin. Um, I had, you know, been using other drugs in the past, but that was my regular choice of drug. And you don't see the correlation between heroin use and heart defects. We are living here in Houston because Phoenix's doctors, when he was discharged from the hospital, they did not want him to be more than like 30 to 45 minutes from the hospital in case anything were to go wrong. And since we've been home, which we've only been home about like two and a half months, um, we've gone to the hospital so many times where he pulled out his feeding tube 
or he got sick with something and we needed to like, go to the ER immediately and things like that. Um, a lot of heart kids, they have to relocate to their hospital to be near their surgeons, be near their doctors, near their teams, because it's just too dangerous. Some hospitals aren't equipped to deal with complex children, so you need to be close by, you need to be where it's safe for them. With Phoenix's situation, I had already been, you know, put through the ringer. I had been, you know, emotionally beat up and physically and in every way and everything possible had happened to me. And facing Phoenix's thing was a definite new journey, but it was, um, I had that, that strength. I had that experience of dealing with trauma, dealing with um, pain, dealing with those emotions just in a different way. So I felt like I was kind of prepared for everything that was being thrown at me with Phoenix. Phoenix has had two open heart surgeries and he um, has a trach, he has feeding tubes. Um, his plan of what's going to happen next for him is he needs another open heart surgery and then Phoenix will also need heart surgeries every like five to seven years, less or more, because um, they're going to be placing a pulmonary artery conduit, a PA conduit, which doesn't grow with the body. His next uh, open heart surgery should bring up his oxygen levels a little bit and hopefully help us get this trach out. That's our goal. Um, and because Phoenix doesn't make any noise or the noise that he does makes is very minimal. It's like puffs of air really. Um, someone has to be watching him all night. So we have um, you know night nurses but they're cutting our hours but you know they have to sit here and they have to watch Phoenix and nights that I don't have a nurse I can't sleep. I gotta sit here and I have to watch him and I have to make sure that he's not gonna pull that trach out or you know he's not gonna be in any danger to himself. So it, it really is, when I say 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that's what he is. He's tube fed and he gets medication around the clock. His food has to be going around the clock, constantly going into him. Um, he's on continuous feeds. His stomach doesn't work. He has to eat through his intestines. So he's still got a lot going on besides the trach, but without the trach, it'll be a little bit more mobility for us, I guess. Um, less equipment to carry if we need to leave the house, when we can leave the house. <laughs> God put him in my life and I am so blessed and, you know, I wake up every morning and I'm happy. You know, this stuff is nothing. I have this baby and I have happiness and I have family now and I have something to really just live for and to enjoy. Like, I love my life now. It may be different to some people, it may be kind of scary to some people, but I love it. This is my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>